we ready to go? I think we are. Um, welcome to the next session. Um, this one's on the media and social media and privacy. My name is Stephen Price. I'm a, um, I'm a blogger, I'm a uh, lawyer, a media lawyer, and I teach at uh, Victoria University of Wellington. Um, and I thought I'd start the session before I introduce the, our four panellists by just actually saying a few obvious things to set the scene. Uh, and the first obvious thing is that in the digital age, we are getting, oh, it's throwing up a whole lot of challenges for privacy. And in part, that's because it's so much easier now to gather information, and that, whether that's legitimately by Google searching or by using cell phone cameras at the scene of an accident, or whether it's cyber stalking or hacking or surveilling, um, suddenly there's a whole lot more information that's easily available at people's fingertips. And on the other hand, it's much easier to put information out there. So anyone can be a publisher, and in a sense, everybody then is the media. Now, for the mainstream media, on the one hand, this is great. There's a whole lot more material. They've got a whole lot more sources. They've got a lot more to write about. <coughs> on the other hand, they've now got competition from social media doing the same sorts of things that they are doing, putting out news reports, uh, reports of inf information of value to the public. Now, when you're the media, you are subject to ethical principles, ethical regulation, whether it's the Press Council, the Broadcasting Standards Authority, the Online Media Standards Authority. Um, and hopefully you are familiar with the legal principles applying to um, privacy in the law. Social media, not so much. They're not subject to those same regimes and they can't be relied on to be familiar with the legal principles. So this throws up a whole range of issues, but the ones I think we're going to focus on here, firstly, are if we think there is something valuable and important about the news media and the reporting of the news media, such that they should be given special protections, and such as source protection and such as exemption from the Privacy Act, who counts as, a, as the news media these days? Who gets those special things? How do we decide? So that's one thing we're going to talk about today. And the other is, what happens when social media and media collide? Um, the social media report news. The media report about social media. What sort of issues are arising? Um, and what should we do about that? Should there be more regulation of social media? Should we do away with regulation altogether? Um, is it becoming increasingly untenable? So I'm mostly going to shut up from here and let our, our very qualified um, panelists comment on that. Um, let me introduce you each, I think, now, and then have you each say a few words about some aspect of those issues, and then we'll perhaps open it up to discussion from the floor, or I'll raise some questions too. So we have John Rowan here. He's a columnist and editorial writer for the New Zealand Herald. We have David Far Farrer, who is a political activist and blogger. Um, Lee Pearson, um, who is a, you're a, corporate, a freelance corporate affairs advisor and a member of the Broadcasting Standards Authority. And Colin Peacock, who produces and presents Media Watch. So we're going to start, I think we'll take you in that order, if that's all right. John, you're going to speak first. Yes, mine is a little bit unusual in that I'm, uh, I, my problem that I've recently had with the Privacy Act involves a book. I wrote a biography of John Key a couple of years ago. And six months after publication, I had a call from, his, from the lawyer acting for him in a defamation suit brought by the cameraman who accidentally recorded um, the Teagate incident. And uh, the lawyer told me that under the terms of the Privacy Act, uh, they were obliged to ask for all my recordings, transcripts and notes that I'd made from my interviews with John Key for the book. Uh, for passing on to the litigant's lawyer for uh, under, under discovery. Um, this, this, was, this was quite an unusual experience. I haven't, I've been lucky in life. I haven't been mugged very much or, uh, or I haven't had a serious house burglary. But this felt like an intrusion on my rights and my property. I mean, I arranged this book. I, I, I talked the Prime Minister into talking to me. I spent hours of my own time recording him. I spent even more hours transcribing and organising the material into themes as I, as I went. And it felt like this material was mine, it was my property, and it was valuable. Um, I, I also knew by that stage that my colleague David Fisher, who'd written a book on Kim.com, had had a similar request from the police that .com must obtain all Fisher's recordings and transcripts, etc., 
uh, for possible for their possible use in their uh, in, in their case for, defort, for, for deportation. Uh, David had resisted this, and uh, the police had got a ruling from the High Court uh, that. Uh, he was not exempt under the Privacy Act. I should probably tell you that there is an exemption for news media in the Privacy Act from having to give up, give over material that they've got from sources or in, informants. But the High Court judge took a very literal reading of the Act, which refers on, which defines news, news media or news articles, I forget which, as as, as, as articles or, or, or programs. So she, she, so she took a very definite view that only journalists who were working for newspapers or broadcasting media were really, ha really had the exemption from the Privacy Act. It didn't apply to books. Um, so I replied to the lawyers, to cut a long story short, I, I replied to the lawyers stating why I believed it was important, just as important for authors of books of non-fiction books anyway, to have the exemption that journalists enjoy because we need people to talk to us in confidence quite often. And journalists have a good working knowledge of defamation and they're aware of the, of the criminal law and sometimes you protect people from exposure to those risks. And we, should have, we, we, and we need the right to do that in order to be able to get people to talk to us in confidence. Made all these points. Um, uh, the lawyers didn't accept it. I'm talking for the lawyers, the litigants here. I mean, John Key's lawyers were just, just a channel. Lawyers for the litigants didn't accept those, and they insisted that uh, the case be taken to the Privacy Commissioner, which it was. And I made a case to the Privacy Commissioner, and I also by then knew that Stephen here had made a successful uh, case for Nikki Hager to resist a, uh, a complaint, I think, or a, or a case under the Privacy Act from Cameron Slater to get the material or to know, or to, do, to in some way get material that was used in, in, in dirty politics. Uh, Stephen had made a very interesting case arguing that under the Bill of Rights Act, uh, ordinary law had to be read in a way that conformed with the, with, with the Bill of Rights Act if possible, and he argued that the Bill of Rights Act's provision of freedom of expression, which includes the freedom to gather as well as express information, meant that meant that um, you know writers of books should also be covered under that Bill of Rights principle. I shamelessly copied all your arguments <laughs> to the Privacy Commissioner without a trip. Uh, well, I mean, I didn't, you know, I just I just borrowed them wholesale. I don't think it's a time honored legal tradition. Yeah, <laughs> but it didn't work for me. <laughs> That's how you tell it, John. <laughs> I, I swear, it wasn't very, it wasn't very different. Um, so, to, and it, but at that point, I, the, 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 the issue had gone on for a year, and I thought, well, you know, I'm just trying to uphold a principle here for the sake of David Fisher and all the writers and the PN organisation and so on who'd backed his backed him up. I didn't want to be the first person to cave on this. But really, you know, I, I didn't have an informant who needed my protection. It was the Prime Minister after all and he was you know, he could, he could he could defend himself easily. I knew I didn't have any material that was really going to be I didn't think would be material in the court case. So at that point I did the sensible thing and said, All right, I, I, I'll I'll agree. But after that uh, the lawyers for the litigants came back to say, well, they'd, they'd, they'd actually extended the, um, what do you call it, not the briefings, the, um, the claim, the, issues. the pleadings. They, they, they broadened the pleadings and now they didn't want just my material relation to Teagate. They wanted everything I had. Uh, and uh, after some to and fro and trying to get assurances, which I never got, the material finally went to them and I haven't heard from them ever since or know what's happened to it or where it's gone. The case was settled out of court and it just leaves me f with a feeling that the Privacy Act has not served me or anybody with, uh, very well here. John, when you say everything, <coughs> what did that entail exactly? Everything, everything. the production of that entire biography? Of no, Prime no, everything that John Key had said to me. Oh, so okay. the, the, his interviews, which about 12 hours of interviews <laughs> and transcripts and notes and anything, anything that that, the whole that, Frost Nixon. That, uh, under the Privacy Act is evidently his property, not mine, which, um, which I struggle with. Were you able to keep a copy? Oh, well, it's all, yes, yeah, I've got, I've got my own copies, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
But I mean, it's, it's valuable property, which I don't want to be getting into other people's hands, really. So we have at least a category of non-fiction books that seem to be still subject to the Privacy Act, which means the rules about you must gather information, um, usually from the source itself, you must only use information when it's accurate and up-to-date and relevant, um, and you can only use or disclose it in accordance with the purposes for which you collected or directly related purposes. All of that, while it doesn't apply to your newsroom, will at least in some circumstances apply to your non-fiction author, and some circumstances not. Um, I, I wonder whether we should invite John to comment on the distinction. Um, I'm also going to invite um, David to, to ask how he thinks it applies to bloggers. Uh, well, I, I could. Uh, I don't want to mire yeah. the discussion down in what would be quite a technical legal argument. Um, we have described the situation uh, in some detail in a blog post which goes through the different court cases. When it came to uh, the use of the Privacy Act for the purposes of it, uh, effecting discovery in civil litigation, uh, we had a very clear direction from Chief High Court Judge Justice Winkelman from which there was simply no wriggle room. It was an identical case to one that had been ruled and, uh, and when we looked at that and saw it was on all fours, frankly, I have to say the conclusion I had to reach was Maybe we got it wrong in, in, in the case uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so, uh, and and that's, that's, that's what happens with statutory officers. We make calls, circumstances change, we reflect on our position. I, like everybody else, is subject to the courts uh, and um, to the uh, judicial review and appeal process. So that's all I say. If you do want to see um, <coughs> the more technical whys and wherefores of it, uh, there's a blog post from about December last year, I think, on why we made a decision in one case uh, that seemed to differ from the other uh, and uh, what we thought was the, um, the legal principles involved. John has just kindly um, offered to make the, the decision in his case available because the, the, the office says it can't, um, but he's happy to give it to you if you like, because he can, as far as I know. I have to, I have to say it, won't, it may not enlighten you, I've read it countless times. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very fine distinction somewhere there that I'm still grappling with. Um, David. Uh, thanks, Stephen. So one of the questions, I guess, is if John and David Fisher, respected journalists, aren't always covered by the Privacy Act when they're writing books, you know, where do bloggers come in? Um, as a blogger, I've got three areas of, I guess, professional concern when it comes to privacy. It's protecting people who choose to comment on your site, but some of them choose not to reveal who they are protecting your sources, people who email you or phone you or write to you to give you information, and protecting people in the news, making decisions about how much information to publish on them. And I'll touch on those last two a bit. In terms of whether bloggers come under the Exemption Privacy Act, I think it's actually really easy, very clear cut, and the answer is yes. Um, I'll give you an example of that. I'll just read out the definition of the Act. It's first about you're exempt if you're a news medium. What's a news medium? Any agency whose business or part of their business consists of a news activity. Well, that means nothing unless you know what a news activity is. News activity is the gathering of news or the preparation or compiling of, quote, articles or programs, or concerning news, observation on news or current affairs for the purposes of dissemination to the public or any section of public. So when you read about that, basically, it's not even has to be news. If you're just sharing observation about the news and you're disseminating it to the public, the way the Privacy Act is written, you get that exemption. Um, I had this not tested in court, but some people here will work out perhaps the people involved and find amusing, but I published a couple of years ago something that someone had sent me about an MP, and the MP took exception, and as my general policy is, uh, if I can't verify, I took it down. And they asked, though, for my source, and I said, like, not prepared to give that. And they came back and quoted the Privacy Act. And I took a certain amount of pleasure in quoting an article written by a very distinguished privacy lawyer who happened to be the MP's sister on why bloggers actually do have an exemption under the Privacy Act. Uh, it's not often you still get that sort of um, slight enjoyment there. Um, under many different acts, bloggers do not count as journalists or media. I don't call myself a journalist. I don't necessarily call myself media. But the Privacy Act is actually quite liberal in terms of that definition. The part where it's not liberal is it has to be an article or a programme. And I'll 
I'll comment on that. The Law Commission recommended a few years ago there should be one definition of media for all acts, and I think that was a great idea. I think it's a bit sad that the government didn't actually choose to implement that. Um, effectively, it was saying you have to do more than just be reporting news, you have to subscribe to a code of ethics and an independent complaints process, which um, Kiwi Blog incidentally now does through OMSA. So, as a blogger, yeah, I think my activities are quite clearly exempt. I have read in some detail John's blog about how they ruled in the three cases, and this is just my paraphrase of it, I thought it was a very carefully crafted blog, but it was, look, we think the court made a pretty stupid decision, where we can get round it we'll give a generous interpretation and we will, but where we can't get round it we have to comply with the court. And I think, um, <laughs> maybe some John in there, uh, so I'm glad my, my, my reading skills are not perhaps too deficient. But when you think about the articles or programs, yeah, it should be substance over form. And I think you know, this artificial distinguishing of what is an article you know, and books aren't. So I think actually they did get it right in the P. Hager's case and they got it wrong in John and David Fisher's case, but not necessarily wrong in the sense of applying the law, more wrong in that um, the, the law needs to be changed. The last thing I'll just touch on because it's sort of a big thing with social media is you know, when is it okay to use what people say on social media? In theory, all tweets are public. If you set your Facebook page to public, it's all public. My general rule of thumb is, have they decided to put themselves in the news? If someone goes to the media with a complaint about their circumstances, they're not getting enough money from the government, um, then I think it's absolutely fair to have a look at what they're put on public and uh, stuff about them. However, if they've been killed in a car crash, their house has been robbed, they're a victim of crime, i.e. them being in the public as incidental, personally I'm not going to go and try and find quotes from them to sort of um, add a bit of juice to it. So uh, that's sort of my general uh, line when it comes to that. Um, so, yeah. We'll change direction a little bit with Lee, who's going to talk about the Broadcasting Standards Authority and its, its approach to privacy. So the Broadcasting Standards Authority, as many of you all know, is a, um, an appeal body, but people can make direct complaints on privacy to the Broadcasting Standards Authority. So we, last year, 143 complaints across all our codes, but um, what we do observe is there is a small increase in the number of complaints on privacy. Um, there's an increase in the number of upholds, and there's an increase in the number of orders. Um, issues for us are around consent, um, conditions of consent, um, what constitutes informed consent. You know, when I say that I'll be on this reality TV show, do I know that it's still going to be run at 3 o'clock in the morning in 10 years' time? Um, what makes a person identifiable? So we're talking about jigsaw identification here. So, OK, I can't identify you on TV in the reality show or whatever, but I can see where you are, I can do a couple of searches and, you know, can I find out who you are, so is your identity revealed that way. Um, and also, um, what is legitimate public interest? Now, I'm a former journalist, I've got journalism in my DNA, um, but sometimes public interest is a pretty broad sweep. Um, uh, so, what I'm interested in, the things that we're struggling, not struggling with, but they're really challenging is sort of the interplay with other media. So the Broadcasting Standards Authority, it's radio and TV, it's broadcast. It's not the internet. It can be, um, we say it, it is live broadcast on the internet, but that's challenged by other agencies. So, you know, where does all that fit in? We had a complaint recently, and I don't want to go into the specifics because it's a privacy complaint, but... As you know, young people put a lot of themselves on Instagram. Um, most of you will know what Instagram is. For those of you who don't, it's a photo sharing site. And um, it's more popular than Facebook amongst young people. Um, and it's public. So there was a radio station that um, wanted to talk about this and talked about wanting us calling on its listeners for a social media intervention. And it invited listeners to call in with what they thought was some some of these young people and what they were doing online, on Instagram. And the, the um, so they got names of people, they were public. And then they talked about these people online. And they had views about that, what they were posting online. And the views were appalling. They were, um, the language that they used and the comments they made was bullying, they were discriminating. 
there was an invitation to harassment. So we upheld that complaint on the grounds of privacy. It had already been upheld by the broadcaster on fairness and good taste and decency, but we upheld it on grounds of privacy. The information had been in the public in, on social media, on Instagram. Where, it, where it, it moved into our space was we said, well, actually, there was, a, a, pro, there was information that was published on the media and on, on radio and that there was an invitation for harassment. So that's, a, that's, that's difficult. And then, of course, we then had some of that published on mainstream media. Um, so where that goes and that interface between public lives on social media and its interplay in mainstream media, I think, is something that we will need to start. We need to think about and work out where that goes and what we, how we manage that. So I'll, I'll leave it there because I think that it's something we all need to talk about. Uh, just a quick comment on that, Lee, just the social media becoming news. I once tried to keep count of the number of mentions of Max Key in the New Zealand Herald, just based on his social media. On his Instagram page. And it was yes. more than any political party leader, yes. except <laughs> John Key and Andrew Little. And his Instagram posts were getting more publicity than, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the people weren't commenting, well there was commentary on it, but it was quite careful commentary. Yeah. And I suppose there's that a boundary, and how do we define that boundary? I don't know what that boundary is. Over to you. Colin. Well, I can pick up on, on that one actually. Sometimes it's into that, that issue of the pilfering of pictures from social media to sit down for a topic. That, that is a really interesting one, and sometimes I just can't see any reason for it. Um, particularly images, is, which I think is sometimes more, more clear cut. But, um, for example, at Radio New Zealand recently, there was a girl who died in a car accident, and her picture was taken because it's publicly available, set to public. And the image was one I just can't see that anyone would want of a family member. It was younger, she was you know, doing gangstery things, and um, maybe most people don't see that as in any way harmful. No permission was asked for, and we thought that wasn't very good. And the opinion was really split, even at a public outfit like Radio New Zealand, um, and some people saw absolutely no problem with that. I don't know. There are other instances where, um, for example, the Herald on Sunday newspaper used to, went through a bit of a period where uh, the most serious fatal car crash often was on the front page of the paper and, it, and often you would see this, these grainy images of people from their social media feeds would, would be published there and listed as supplied and some people challenged that and some didn't but sometimes that can be a part of the story. In one instance um, the social media posts of this guy who died in a car crash about four in the morning in central Auckland I think um, has posted said things like oh, I've been working seven days solid Saturday night, party night, woohoo, and you know, could this be connected with his death? So maybe there's a news justification for it. So in some cases, um, you know, it could be a bit of a fine balance. Um, but more broadly, I mean, at Media Watch, we get public concerns about privacy, as I guess you do, Lee. And I think broadly, you know, people want their privacy respected, and think other people's privacy should be too. That's uh, that's that's kind of a given. But they also broadly, I think, recognise that journalists have a kind of right to intrude and, and that they should do that on, on the public behalf. How they exercise it is obviously the issue where the public interest is. Um, and often I think the public have a very different idea of what the public interest is to the journalists. And what I would say about the complaints we get, and I don't know if this squares with you at all, Lee, and the ones you get, but often when people complain to Media Watch, and the people who are motivated to complain may not be representative of the whole you know, public media audience. But often I find when it's privacy, they're not actually complaining about the actual unwanted exposure of or unjustified intrusion into people's solitude or privacy. It's, it's not really the, um, the publication of private facts that a reasonable person would find offensive or objectionable. It's often they just don't think that the revelation of it was of sufficient public interest. They don't really approve of the story being in the media. Um, and, and often, they're complaining because they think other people will be offended, which I know drives the media mad, um, that, that notion of being offended on, on behalf of others. Um, so one example I think would be a couple of years back, David Bain got married and the press in Christchurch sent a helicopter up, took worse than useless photographs of um, figures on the ground, uh, could have been anybody, and published those. 
And I think it was interesting interviewing the editor afterwards, who happened to be not there at the time the decision was taken, had to kind of, I think, defend a decision that she possibly wouldn't have taken herself. I don't know. But um, that, was, that was a difficult one to argue. And then again, the press, don't mean to pick on them, but do you remember that story of the office sex romp that burst out? And that had all of it. That had the social media, uh, the public interest, and so on, uh, or lack of. And then, I guess, the, the woman and the man at the centre of that being pursued door stopped and all the rest, I couldn't see the interest in that. So that was another one that really got people going. Um, but another thing, I mean, Lee, you mentioned that privacy complaints going up a little to the, to the I would say for, to our programme, my feeling is, I haven't kept numbers, that they're really drying up and I wonder if the expectations about privacy and what's okay, what isn't, uh, what looks like an intrusion has actually been lowered and possibly because there is now so much surrendering of privacy you know, via social media and the things we've just been talking about. So whether perhaps with all the oversharing and sharing that's going on, uh, maybe um, the public have kind of pushed past the media, which still broadly, you know, uphold the standards that are set down and things like their own code books and the Broadcasting Standards Authority and the Press Council. Um, so I think now the media can be in the position of, instead of in the past they might have known things or had pictures, information and they're making the judgment they might be intrusive but should we make this public so that the public can know about it because otherwise they won't and now they're in the position of wow this is obviously interesting to the public because look at it flying around social media should we jump on this too and publish this stuff or are we stretching our own ethics and should we not but I guess if you're an editor you're sitting there thinking why should we miss out if everyone else is looking at it so those sorts of things will go on and on. And just briefly, I mean, 10 years ago there was an event that you were at, Stephen, and I think I was too, where this was discussed, a privacy commission event. The media then, very concerned about a cult of privacy, a privacy movement developing, very worried about how the law was going to be interpreted and challenges to it. I don't think much of that's actually happened too much in the past 10 years, except in, in very odd cases like, like John's, which are actually much more important. Um, and I don't think people's attitudes have changed a great deal, apart from, as I mentioned, this possible pushing past and, and what people actually feel ambushed by when they're watching the TV or, or reading the papers. Um, so, yeah, in the end, um, Stephen, at that meeting, uh, you referred to a, a BSA book that was published that tried to identify which this gap was between um, the media's interpretation and the audience, and that the media people there, you define their attitudes that the media think the public are sookies and that they're too worried about, you know, that they think people's consent should always be given. But in the end, they probably recognise that if, that if the right to intrude on people is exercised in the public interest, they don't really have a problem with it. And I don't see that's really changed. Do we have questions from <laughs> Ursula? Oh, thanks, Stephen. That's right. Hi, um, Colin. Um, you and I have discussed privacy recently in relation to the English case and the injunction we're still waiting to hear about. But I... Um, can I just take issue with you suggesting that um, the, the boundaries might have changed and people's tolerance might have, to, to breaches of privacy might have increased? I, I know from all the groups I speak to and my own students and so on, I'm, I'm the Dean of the Law School at, at Canterbury University. Um, um, people do care about privacy. I don't believe that's um, decreased over the years. In fact, I think it's increasing. People no, feel true. powerless. And, um, for example, I complained to the press about the coverage of the Bain wedding. Mm -hmm. um, and they published a letter from me and from a number of others. Um, but the numbers of people who contacted me and said, thank God you complained, was just exponentially far greater than just the number of letters in, in the newspaper. So I know people are, they don't know how to complain. They're a bit unsure about complaining. Um, they don't like to stick their head up above the parapet. They, they, the media can respond quite vigorously, as we know, to um, attempts to support privacy. So it takes a lot, actually, to stand up and suggest that a media outlet has behaved wrongly. So um, I, I would disagree with your suggestion but there. I think that the fear was, sort of seen 10 years ago, that people were going to try to use the law against the media more in these cases. And I don't think that happened. So do you think that... Well, but people clearly have a case like that. We'll, we'll get people going all that office sex story. Um, well, uh, you know, th those those have I think clear examples of boundaries being breached and no real no real public interest 
in those, and I think that would have to be conceded in the end. But do you think people now have the opinion that the media are going to do that far more often than in the past? Because I think people get upset by extreme cases, but in the routine operation of journalists and day-to-day, -day, do you think that, that they think the media are more likely to run roughshod over people's individuals' privacy? Because it's often it's a case where it's individuals, isn't it? Where, where people find themselves in the news where they shouldn't. But are you suggesting that because they think media might do it more often, they now accept it? Is that what you were suggesting? No, I think people think that... I have, I, I have the feeling that the broad sweep of the audience feels that they are, they are still extremely exceptional cases that the media haven't set the boundaries too far, and that things like the Bain wedding is where somebody makes a very bad decision. But I, I think that's where that, that one could probably fit that case, because the rest of the media didn't show a great deal of interest in yeah, David I, Bain I getting married. A lot of people showed interest in that office sex story because it's such a novelty, so shareable, went worldwide. You know, That <coughs> ended up pursuing, that woman was pursued all the way to England. I um, know, and that was appalling. The local I, papers where she relocated to in the UK picked up the story well, from yeah. here and published no. the images off yeah. TV3's news bulletin. I yeah. I, look, I don't want to dominate the microphone, but uh, <laughs> so I'll give over to somebody else to, to ask some questions. But um, uh, no, I, I think that because we're lucky in New Zealand in the sense that we don't, for example, have the tabloid culture of media as the UK does, so I think that's part of the reason why perhaps people aren't using or needing to use privacy against our media, and I personally hope that continues. Mm, yeah. I do think with um, with the BSA that I notice a, a lot, a lot of the complaints that we get around privacy are often um, reality TV, and um, this, the consent process for some of these programs, not all of them, is 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 seriously wanting. People don't know what they sign up for. Often they're people who don't know how to complain. They don't know the. What, what's, what's involved, they don't, they're afraid of that process, um, so they, um, and they, and they don't know what to ask when they sign up, when they consent. Yeah. And they're they, probably aware that it'll take a while as well, if yeah. they do pursue yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, so I, I, I think, I, I agree with you, I think there is an awareness, um, and it's, it's, I think there's a growing awareness actually. Um, what would have been an interesting case um, is the Bob Jones Rod Vaughan case where TVNZ yes. pursued <laughs> Bob Jones after he announced the party was dissolving to his fishing on the Tongariro River. Now he chose an alternate resolution to the Privacy <laughs> Commissioner, uh, but he became sort of a national hero for this. Um, and part of that might just be media easy people to scapegoat, but I think part of it was the New Zealand just felt his privacy was invaded. That is one thing to go to his office, but to follow him in a helicopter, a bit like the David Bain one. Well, know, that was the solitude, isn't it? This yeah. entitlement to solitude, yeah. he'd chosen that. Yeah. Just for those who don't know, um, the, the remedy that, that David was referring to was a punch in the face. <laughs> yeah. um, Joe, you wanted to answer? Y yes, just um, in, in the previous session I was talking of, about an evidence base. And I thought that perhaps you would find it interesting if I shared some of the evidence which we've uncovered over the past... Uh, five years of, um, let me see, nearly 20,000 online interviews, about 500 focus groups and 800 face-to-face -face interviews in about, I don't know, 27 countries around Europe. Um, and the, the bottom line is, and this responds to um, Colin's uh, reactional perceptions, um, the bottom line is that people actually seem to be caring more about privacy. They care more about surveillance. But the, the, the curious thing, and this was something I was sharing with John um, over a chat yesterday, the curious thing is you could be out in the field, in the focus group or with a mic in your hand in a face-to-face -face interview, and you're asking people, do you care about surveillance, do you care about privacy, can you look at the scenario, etc. But then, a very important incidental finding is that they want to talk to you about reputation. Yeah. They want to tell you how upset they are that using modern means, whether it's blogs, whether it's uh, WhatsApp, whether it's uh, Twitter, how vulnerable they feel, and that is where they feel helpless, that their dignity, that their reputation is being sabotaged across borders, across whatever you like, and they feel helpless to do something about it. And I think that while the point is very well made that those of us who run courses for law for journalists, etc., etc., know what 
journalists have to learn and the standards they have to respect. At the same time, um, so many people who are blogging or writing um, don't know or don't care about those standards and are not held to them. And what I'm suggesting is that there's a growing public, public consciousness that perhaps people should be held to standards. And the problem is which standards and what for sanction would be applied and how are we going to educate people? So in some of the <coughs> policy briefs that we have drawn up to be presented to the European Parliament or the U European Commission, we've actually put in um, privacy education and <coughs> defamation education um, almost you know, before sex education, right? So um, starting at the age of five or six, trying to train people <coughs> about the flows of information in society and the impacts of those flows. I thought I would just share those thoughts with you. Can I just ask a panel, is there a place for like a social media <coughs> tribunal? Uh, I think there probably is, and that's an unpopular view in the industry because the, tr the thinking is all in the other direction, that convergence means that all media are the same, it should be treated the same, <coughs> the same complaints body. I suspect that the way we react and the way we receive different media is quite different and the standards that we expect from them are quite different. But this is, I'm going out on a limb here, and, uh, um, but I've got a feeling that we're still, we're still grappling with social media, still working out the rules and how it should operate. It wouldn't surprise me if in the end uh, it's quite different and right now newspapers, old media if you like, we think that anything on social media is pretty much fair game because it's out there and why should, as someone said, why should we not use it if everybody else can see it? But the, uh, there is a, there's a difference in the way that we, that we take different media and I was intrigued by your example of the billboard put outside a school showing children's postings and saying to them, this is what you put up. And they feel, no we didn't. And they didn't. They didn't put it on a billboard. On their little cell phones, it was quite a different experience for them and for the receiver. And the same goes a little bit with newspapers and broadcasting. That, that's more like the billboard than the private self-chosen exchange of information. So I think that I think that's where we should be heading, but, but we're actually heading the other way, towards treating all media the same. It does raise a really interesting question about context, because there are some contexts where people are putting things out there, often young people, in a, in a forum where they know and can reasonably expect it's only going to be read by a dozen of their closest friends, and then, but it's public. Mm. Um, we, we saw this some years ago with um, Bill English's son, who made yeah. some remarks that could be interpreted as homophobic, which were homophobic. Um, and, and attacking some other people, and that became a news story. Um, and the question was, ought the media to have, was there a privacy issue there at all? And David, you're kind of, you must be confronted with this from time to time. <coughs> yeah, I mean, in terms of the sort of tribunal idea, I mean, it's not quite, I mean, we do now have the HDCA, which will deal with harmful communication. I actually think, rather have separate tribunals, I personally support one media regulator. I think you should merge BSA, press council, OMSA all together. But and you may have different standards um, based on what the medium is. Yeah, I think realistically you'll have slightly different expectations of a company with a thousand staff and a blogger who does it in their spare time. The, the irony with OMSA, I'm a member of it, Whale Oil is a member, and all this the, is the online media standards authority. Is that there's been three complaints and one appeal against Whale Oil. He's won them all, which yeah. you know, you'd, well, wouldn't be a Becky person there. Rail Radio New Zealand actually lost one to do with how quickly they responded to uh, social media. I think OMSA got about right, where I think they said, well, you know, you're an organisation with lots of staff, just not checking your social media page for three days when you know there's been some bad stuff there isn't there. So I don't think you need a separate one. I just think you need regulators to actually just have a bit of common sense. Do you think, though, with OMSA, though, that there's still not a great deal of awareness of oh, the zero. ability to complain? So, you know, you, you can't really say you've only had three complaints or four complaints and say there's not a need. Yeah because I just don't think that there's a weirdness. And these are still voluntary as well. So would you apply this to bloggers who haven't joined voluntarily? Oh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's purely a choice for the blogger well, to If we go back themselves. to the Law Commission recommendation, though, which was if you want the perks and benefits and privileges yeah. of news media, they said you have to sign up to a code of ethics and an independent complaints process. So 
look, you know, if you're Joe at home who just blogs on their Facebook page, you know, that that shouldn't be something that has some sort of regulator there beyond the law. But if you're someone who wants to be seen as a form of media and you want those privileges like protecting your sources, yeah, then I think you should be required to be. Anyone else have thoughts about that? No, well, that, that, that makes sense. I mean, has it made a difference to you, David, having been signed up to that code? Have you changed the way you've behaved uh, online? Or, or has it, have, have you had to face down complaints that you wouldn't have? No, I haven't to? actually had... Well, I tend to be pretty reasonable with stuff anyway. Where if people come to me, um, the most common is I said some really stupid stuff X years ago um, and you come up really high in Google searches, would you please remove it? <laughs> Probably there's no basis for me to do so under any law, but I just sort of go on that, well, you know, unless I think they're someone who's going to keep doing bad stuff, I give them the benefit of the doubt. So I've never had a complaint that would be an OMSA type complaint where I've sort of refused it and they go through to OMSA. I think it does drive me. It's partly, I think, what uh, Nikki's book, Dirty Politics and what came out, of course, you know, there was a chapter on me on there, is an awareness on there's going to be greater scrutiny. So yeah, you probably think you're now in an atmosphere, an environment where... But that's not because you've got to abide by a code of ethics that's written down on a regulator's I don't think website. it changed. <laughs> I wouldn't have signed up to it if I felt that I had to make massive changes to comply. In fact, I looked at him and thought, well, actually, I don't have any problem you complied with, already. with what's there. Yeah. Okay. I think we've got one last question. Um, yeah, David, I, I'm curious to know about uh, people who post comments. I, 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 are they moderated? I take it they're not moderated, and you'd probably find comments that might breach your, uh, you know, your um, rules and regulations. Um, but tell me, how do you cope with those, and uh, you know, how do you manage the comments on your, on your blog? Uh, thanks, Charles. Yeah, there's, I think, at last count, 1.8 million comments. So for a one-person operation, that's a lot. I don't see most of them. I don't read most of the comments because I also have to earn money. Um, what I do is there's two things. First is the first time someone comments it's held in moderation, uh, just that helps catch the spammers or the people who come in being vile from the start. But after that, they all appear automatically, which is quite common on most, uh, but not all blog platforms. I have a complaints process where people can just email me, and people are pretty active on this. It takes up quite a bit of my time. In an average week, I probably have five to 10 complaints about comments. And I either delete the comment or edit it to remove the things. And I have a bit like the traffic cops, a demerit system, where you get so many demerit points and strikes and you get suspended for a week, then for two weeks, then four weeks. Um, if you get 10 strikes, you then get a lifetime ban. And it generally has worked as an incentive that people, unless they want to be banned forever, uh, start to moderate it. But there is always still some quite vile comments there. No one just has bothered to complain about them, etc. So it's based on people actually complaining. On your blog, do you actually tell them yeah, yeah, there's a very lengthy page on what's acceptable, what's unacceptable, um, and listing actually links to all the comments which have got people demerits and strikes, so people can see the sort of case studies of what I've ruled acceptable, unacceptable. Okay, well I, I think we're going to have to leave it on that point, but thank you very much to the panellists for a very interesting and informative discussion. And, um, <laughs> thank you very much.